Welcome to Python vs. JavaScript for Pythonistas. My name is Chris, and I will be your guide. This course excerpt covers JavaScript quirks. This video consists of several of the lessons from a full course teaching JavaScript for programmers familiar with Python. The full course covers the JavaScript typing system, JavaScript functions, both named and anonymous, as well as the arrow shortcut, objects and classes, general syntax, and all those things in JavaScript that might surprise Python programmers. The article this course was built on at the course itself, and lots of other content is available at realpython.com. A quick note on versions. For this course, it isn't going to matter very much, but the code itself was tested in Python 3.9, Node 14.12, and most of the JavaScript is ES6 based. I'll point out as I go along anything that differs from this. Other versions should work equally well. There's not much version specific in the course. JavaScript's original intent was to do some client-side form validation on web pages. The first version of the language inside of the Netscape browser only took 10 days to write. JavaScript becoming ECMAScript has helped bring consistency to it and made it far more standardized. But how it got there was pretty organic. Many of the browser makers wrote non-standard features into the language, and then if they grew popular, they got pulled into the standard later. It wasn't really until ES6 that things started to settle down. This organic growth combined with the language's simple original intent has made for some odd language decisions. Some of these things are behaviors that Pythonistas wouldn't expect, and some are just plain wacky from a computer science point of view. Many of the things I'm going to talk about in this lesson can just be avoided by using the more modern parts of JavaScript. That being said, you are likely to run into some of these in the field. The first set of quirks I want to talk about are those with arrays. JavaScript's array objects don't behave like lists or tuples in Python, or like arrays in any other C-based language for that matter. They're closer to the idea of an ordered dictionary where the key is the index number of the array. If you delete an item from an array, it removes the item but doesn't remove the space it was in. To do what you'd expect, you have to use the splice method instead of the delete keyword. Arrays support sorting, but by default only sort strings. Because of JavaScript's auto typecasting, when you go to sort numbers, they'll be sorted alphabetically. And the one that bites me all the time is the in keyword. In JavaScript, the in keyword tells you if a key is in an object. Unlike Python, it won't tell you if an item is in an array. It will tell you if there's an item at that index in the array. If you use it like you do in Python, you might even get back true if it happens that the number in the array you're checking for is a valid index. I can't count the number of times I've blown off my toes with this one. Constantly switching back and forth between Python and JavaScript makes this an easy mistake to make. Let's take a look at these quirks in the node REPL. Here is an array of fruit. Now I'll delete the second item. Here's the resulting array. Well, that's fun, isn't it? As the spot is still there, the length of the array hasn't changed. It gets weirder. You can assign indexes of the array out of order. It just creates a bunch of empty spaces. To get the more expected behavior, use the splice method on the array. Let me show you that with a new array. Splicing on index two for a length of one item returns the single item at index two and modifies the array. Here's the array after the call. Splice also allows you to insert things at a splice point, and you can delete zero items while doing it. Splice is my go-to anytime I need to do anything with arrays. Simply avoid using the delete keyword altogether. Okay, back to the fruit for a moment. Let's do some sorting. Nothing surprising here. How about some numbers? As I mentioned before, by default, sorting only works on strings. Each of these numbers is typecast to a string and sorted based on that. 
values starting with one come before values starting with two, etc. If you want actual numeric sorting, you have to pass a comparison function to the sort call. The comparison function is called with two items to be compared. If the first item is bigger than the second, return a positive value. If they're the same, return zero, and if it is smaller, return a negative value. For numbers, subtracting one from the other will achieve this result. Finally, here's that in keyword that gets me all the time. This is the correct usage in JavaScript, which is the same as Python. This returns true because name is a key in the object. And of course, it returns false if the key isn't in the object. Now using it with an array. Doing it again. The items in the array aren't keys, they're attributes. One in is returning true because there is an item at index one. Three in is returning false because there isn't anything at index three. What makes this particularly painful for me is I often open a console and type a bit in to jog my memory of what works and what doesn't in JavaScript. If I choose the wrong example to test, it looks like in does what I want to, and then I'm bug hunting. Hopefully, by writing this lesson and explaining it to you, I'll finally remember to stop making this mistake. JavaScript requires semicolons to distinguish between lines of code, similar to its spiritual ancestor, C. For convenience sake, it is capable of taking a guess as to where these semicolons go, and the parser will insert them for you. 99% of the time, this is fine. You've seen how sloppy I've been about it in other lessons. There are some edge cases, though consider the following code. This will result in a parsing error. That's because the parser doesn't pay any attention to new lines. It sees that code snippet as this. You can't name a function with a number, so you get an error. To get this to work as expected, you want to be explicit about your semicolon. This quirk can be even trickier. You could conceive of a weird edge case where instead of adding three, you were adding a variable. The same thing would happen, but you wouldn't get an obvious parsing error. You'd get a runtime error when it tried to call your variable as a function. JavaScript has a lot of choice when it comes to loops. This can be a bit daunting if you're not used to the nuances of each type. In a previous lesson, I demonstrated the C-like for loop structure. The three parts of it indicate an initializer that is run before the loop, a comparator that, if true, allows the next iteration of the loop to run, and the third section, run before entering the next iteration of a loop, typically used to increment your counter. You can leave the initializer, condition, and incrementer portions of the for loop empty in order to get an infinite loop. JavaScript also supports a while loop and a do while loop. This is like a while loop, but the condition check is done after the first iteration. This can be useful if you want to do something once for sure, and then possibly repeat it a few more times. Like Python, JavaScript supports the continue and break keywords to skip to the top of an iteration or leave the loop altogether, respectively. Previously, I spoke about my nemesis, the in keyword. You can use this in a for loop to iterate over the key names of an object. As I pointed out before, you can't use this with an array. This also has the confounding feature that it includes things attached to the prototype. So if you've got a richer object rather than just a vanilla dictionary-like thing, you may get more than you expect. The attributes returned by the in keyword have a method called hasOwnProperty, which will return true if the attribute belongs to the object instance. To safely use for and in together, you should check that the attribute belongs to the instance of the object. To get around the pesky arrays don't work within problem, JavaScript introduced the of keyword. For arrays, this behaves like the for iterator in Python. The most common way of iterating over an array in JavaScript is to use a method on the array called for each. This takes a function with a single parameter. The function is called once for each item in the array, passing the parameter in. 
I've shown it here with an arrow operator, but it works with the regular anonymous function as well. When using a function to build a constructor object instead of the ES6 class concept, you can run into a problem if you forget the new keyword. When I build Bob, it works. When I build Joe, I get back nothing, it's undefined. If you forget the new keyword, you won't get an object back. There are some clever tricks you can use to check whether this is happening inside the constructor function to prevent this problem, but I prefer to just stick with ES6 classes. You'll get an error if you make this mistake with a class. In a previous lesson, I touched on the fact that everything is a global declaration by default. This can cause unexpected behaviors if you forget to use the let or var keywords. You may recall that the var keyword defines context level scoping. If it's in the global space, it is global. If it is in a function, it is at the function level. It is important to note that it doesn't matter where in the function it is declared. It is visible to the whole function. Declaring a variable inside code blocks like if statements or loops doesn't hide the variable from the function. This can cause some unexpected behaviors. To demonstrate, here's a little puzzle. Take a second and read the code. Write down what you think the output will be. How'd you do? Don't worry if you didn't get it. Something a bit strange is going on here. It is called variable hoisting. The declaration of var x in the function causes the namespace override for the whole function even before the line where it is declared. What is happening under the covers is closer to the following code. Because JavaScript does this for you automatically, you can get some surprising results. Variables aren't the only things that are hoisted. Function definitions are as well. This means you can call a function before it appears in the code. Be careful though, if you use var to define a reference to a function expression, it will get hoisted and the variable definition will exist before the function expression assignment and you're back to having a problem. These are all avoidable problems simply by using the modern let and const declaration methods instead. I've spoken before about the implicit typecasting in JavaScript and how it can get you in trouble. This can make comparing two values complicated. Here are some examples. So far, so good. Typecasting makes these the same. This was so problematic that JavaScript introduced another kind of comparison operator, the triple equals. The triple equals compares the value and makes sure that both items are of the same type. This fixes the problem. There is also a not double equals, which is the not equals of the triple equals world. The weirdness goes deeper than just strings and numbers. You can get some strange things with arrays as well. See, kind of weird. Best practices, always use triple equals. The original JavaScript didn't have integers, it had numbers. It wasn't until 2020 when ES11 introduced the big int type. Fortunately, it was adopted quickly and as of this recording has almost 90% penetration in the browser space. If JavaScript numbers aren't integers, what are they? Well, they're floats. This is problematic as floats are meant for storing a huge range of numbers, but they do this at the cost of precision. This precision problem becomes evident when dealing with certain decimal values. To be clear, this isn't a JavaScript specific thing. It is a float thing and in almost all languages. That being said though, almost all languages give you a way to opt out of the use of float. Prior to BigInt, you had no other choice in JavaScript. Precision isn't the only problem. There is also a numeric ceiling. If you're dealing with large numbers, you may get unexpected behavior. The introduction of BigInt solves this problem. JavaScript has built in the suffix n to indicate that a number is a primitive type BigInt. A BigInt is much larger than the biggest integer for a number. The ceiling problem from before has been lifted. Without the n on 42, the type of is number. With the n, it's type of big int. And of course, there's also the big int object, 
which will always be type of object because it's a reference type. I know you think you've seen function signatures in JavaScript, but they're not really there, at least not in the way they are in Python. I briefly touched on this in a previous lesson when showing you default arguments. The parameters in the declaration are a shortcut to make it easier to get at what was passed in, but they don't change the execution. They're there to make your life easier, that's it. There's a neat feature which I haven't shown you though, which is the arguments variable, which you can get at to see all of the arguments passed in. Let me open up a node session and demonstrate all of these things. First, let me define a function. This function returns a Boolean version of whatever was passed in. In the return statement, I'm using the not operator twice. In JavaScript, like most C languages, the exclamation point, or bang, is the not operator. Using it twice like this is a shortcut to convert a value to Boolean. The first time you not something will convert it to Boolean and negate it. The second time you not something will invert it. And of course, if you're inverting the negated thing, you get a Boolean of the same value as the thing passed in. Now let me call it. This shows that JavaScript considers one to be equivalent to true. That's great and everything, but I believe I was talking about arguments. Let's send all sorts of random stuff to truthy. In Python, this would create an error. JavaScript sees the 42, which is a number greater than zero, which it considers true, and then ignores all the other arguments. Change 42 to zero, and you get false back. Same explanation as before, except this time I'm getting the truthiness of zero, which is false. Calling the function without arguments will result in an undefined expression. Undefined converts to false. Like many examples before where you'd get an error in other languages, JavaScript just keeps on trucking. Now a quick demo of the arguments value. The contents of arguments is an array-like thing containing the arguments to the function. Using the triple dot rest operator destructures arguments inside of the array. I can then run the reduce function on the resulting array and sum up its contents. Look at that, math. You may have heard me use the phrase array-like when I spoke of the arguments value. I did that on purpose. It isn't an array. It is iterable, and as you've seen here, it can be destructured. But unlike an array object, it doesn't support for each or reduce or any of the other array methods. This is why it had to be destructured into an array before calling reduce in the sum function. I guess that's a bit of a quirk inside of a quirk. It's moving past quirktastic and into quirkerific territory here. What's better than one nothing? Well, two nothings, of course. JavaScript has two equivalents to Python's none value, null and undefined. Variables that have been defined but not set to a value are set to undefined. You can assign undefined to a variable, or you can also assign null to a variable. The difference is subtle. Because JavaScript isn't finicky about the arguments to functions, you may need a way to distinguish between I want this empty and I forgot to send something in. To indicate to a function that you want an optional parameter to be empty, you can send in null. If you send undefined instead, you'd have no way of distinguishing between that case and the argument being left off altogether. With default arguments available in ES6, the importance of null is waning. In previous lessons, I've used the this keyword within the context of functions inside of objects. The concept is similar to the use of self inside of Python. If you've ever had the thought, why do I have to explicitly define self? Why can't it be done magically for me? Well, the rest of this lesson will make you swear off magic. The problem with this is how it magically gets set. Unlike Python's self that is explicitly passed into an object method, the value of this is based on how the function it is contained within is called. It gets complicated when you start getting functions inside of functions, and JavaScript frequently does this. 
To further complicate things, the arrow function behaves differently. It's actually much cleaner, but mixing and matching it in code can cause surprising results. On this slide, you'll see the this keyword used in three different situations. First off, I've assigned it to the global variable x. This highlights how this is different than self in Python. Self is always within the context of an object. In JavaScript, the context is based on the calling function. If there is no calling function, then this means the global context. Inside of a browser, this is the window context, but similar idea. In a global level function, such as print, the context of this is the global context. The third segment here is an object called John. This is similar to how you've seen me use this before. Within this context, the value of this is the containing object. It may be helpful to think about these three different contexts by considering what is calling the function. To call the Cleese method, you write John.Cleese. Calling the print function is actually a short form for calling global.print or window.print in a browser. The context of this is what's on the left of the dot in the calling statement. So when you call john.cleese, this is the john object. When you call print, that really means you're calling global.print, and this is what's to the left of the dot, which is the global context. This is important to understand before I make it more complicated. In Python, self is the object. In JavaScript, the context is based on how the function was called. This has consequences with nested and anonymous functions. Let's look at context within a more complicated object. The fruit object has an attribute called items that is an array of apple, banana, and pear. There is also a method called show. Within that method, the context of this is the fruit object itself. So far, this is the same as the John object on the previous slide. But here's where it gets a little messier. Within the show method, I want to iterate through the different fruit in the items array. A convenient way to do this is using the for each method on the array. The for each method takes an anonymous function which it calls for each item as it is visited in the array. Within the context of this anonymous function, the this keyword is no longer bound to the fruit object, but to the global context. Think back to the how is it called concept I mentioned previously. What is to the left of the calling dot of an anonymous function? It can't be fruit because you're not inside of the calling function on fruit. Anonymous functions end up in the global context. The resulting consequence is your this keyword no longer points to the fruit object. In fact, without taking additional steps, you have no way of getting at the fruit context here at all. In a past lesson, I introduced you to the arrow function. I explained it as a shortcut for defining functions. Well, it has another important aspect. It treats the this keyword differently. In fact, it doesn't use it. Within the context of an arrow function, the this hasn't changed. It can be accessed, though. Consider this display method. The first this is the fruit object, as this is inside the member function display. The difference between the show method and the display method is how I'm calling the for each. This time I'm using an arrow function inside of the for each. As the arrow function doesn't rebind the this value, it will still be whatever value it was before, which is the context of this inside of the display function, which is the fruit object. This is a really good reason for using arrow functions inside of object methods. It makes the this behave an awful lot more like self in Python. One word of caution though, the lack of context in an arrow function can be a problem as well as a solution. Consider this last piece of code. By using the shortcut to define the method spear, you aren't going to get the value of this. If you stop the code at this point and examine the value of this, you'd find it was an empty object. When I first came across the arrow function, I wasn't aware of this difference. In fact, at the time, I thought that this keyword was like self in Python. A very frustrating afternoon followed by a chat with a friend of mine cleared a bunch of this up. 
if, like me, your mental model of this is based on other languages, you can be in for some surprises, and not the happy birthday kind, but more like the parking ticket kind. There are other solutions to the context problem than just the arrow function. A common workaround is to store the value of this in another variable, common name for it is that, within the scope of nested anonymous functions. The value of that will still be available and the original object. Some functions, like for each on arrays, take a parameter that allows you to set the context. When using for each, you can pass in the current context of this, and for each will set that context inside of the anonymous function. This is handy, but it isn't available on all functions, but if you're using for each, you can take advantage of it. JavaScript provides three built in functions that allow you to explicitly set the context for a calling function. The first is apply. Use the name of the function you were going to call, and then call apply on that function name instead. You can pass in context and arguments for the named function. The call built in is exactly like the apply built in, but instead of taking an array of arguments, it uses multi argument syntax. And finally, the bind built in takes the named function, binds the given context, and returns a new function. You can then call the new function from anywhere, and this will be set appropriately wherever you are. Bind is pretty powerful, but it can make for some hard to trace code. If the bind happens in a different file or hundreds of lines above, it is easy to forget that the context has been changed and not correctly understand the value of this when you're reading the code. Everything on this slide feels kind of hackish now that arrow functions exist. And I don't mean hackish in the I'm proud of the workaround I found, isn't this cool, more of the I'm ashamed it has come to this kind of fashion. Thanks for your attention. I hope this has been useful for you. Don't forget to check out this course, other articles, podcasts, and lots of other good stuff at realpython.com.